Close coverage of interview in the Oval Office by the Midwestern newspapers with President Ronald Reagan. Tape number one, Cochran Camera Homes recording. Huh? Never been a tape recorder in this office, have you? Just the ones that you bring in. <laughs> Mr. President, a recent poll showed you beating uh, Mondale among independent voters, but uh, losing to Hart. Uh, given the fact that independents possibly can be expected to decide uh, the next election, um, why do you think Hart has this advantage uh, among independents at this time, and how do you propose to counter it, assuming he's a nominee? Oh, I think that we're, I think that we're seeing a contest that is going on over there that is very much in people's minds and and uh, in the press and in the media uh, so that uh, as I've always said I think polls are pertinent to when they're taken and uh, there have also been several polls that have shown the reverse that, uh, that I'm doing all right so I I'm just going to wait for that poll that takes place next November. You care to tell us what the chief vulnerabilities seem to be for Hart and Mondale? No, I'd rather not comment on their problems. I enjoy watching it. Mr. President, next November uh, you plan to win re-election, I, I know. Uh, I'm wondering whether you think the, the prize will be worth it. Uh, we're facing huge deficits, possibilities of tax increases. A second Reagan administration may not be able to come up with uh, many new exciting initiatives for the American people. Uh, do, you think, do you think it's going to be a, a, a terrible chore in the second term, or are you going to be able to excite the public somehow? Well, to a certain extent, it's always quite a chore. But uh, no, one of the reasons why I would like to run is the job is unfinished. And I think we've made a tremendous start on getting things correct that have needed correct for decades. And um, it just uh, isn't possible to get the job done in these, in these few years. But will, will there be a possibility of any new initiatives when we're facing these kinds of problems, the deficits and the uh, possibility of tax increases and so forth? Well, How do you start new programs if you don't have money to pay for them? Well, maybe if we continue on the course we're on, uh, I am convinced that we will reduce the cost of government, certainly the rate of increase in government spending, we have already. We've about cut it in two. And the, we're doing uh, the things that I think uh, needed doing. We are bringing unemployment down at a faster rate than it's been brought down in more than 30 years. Uh, the growth in gross national product and productivity and retail sales, all of those economic indicators are up. And yes, it is going to take some time, but I'd like to recall to you that I said uh, a couple of years ago that this wouldn't be done in months and it wouldn't even be done in just a few years, that it was, it's been coming on for a half a century. And so um, I foresee getting some of the things that we've been refused so far. We've only obtained about half of what we asked in changes in government spending. Now we'll keep on going for the other half. What, what are some of those things, Mr. President? Well, there, I tell you, a great many of them would be found and will be found in the uh, recommendations of the Grace Commission. Almost 2,000 top leaders in every facet of our economy volunteered their services to take a look at government and take a look from the standpoint of uh, whether modern business practices could improve things, improve the way of doing things, and they now have given us almost 2,500 recommendations. And uh, we have a task force of our own now that is working on those to see, because many of them, the bulk of them, will take legislation. I mean, in terms of, of new initiatives in a second Reagan, Reagan administration, not, not the things that are needed to cut the deficit, but new programs, perhaps. Do you have well, anything like that in mind? If there are new programs that would be beneficial to the people and uh, proper to, uh, to employ, why, yes, you'd go that way. But right now, uh, I think a great deal of our problem is 
that government has attempted to do a great many things that aren't government's proper prerogative. Mr. President, Mr. President, are some of those things, entitlement programs affecting the middle class, and will those be off limit in the second now, I time? think that the entitlement programs have to be looked at structurally. And uh, that's got to be a very careful study because there is no way that I would ever support pulling the rug out from under people that are presently dependent on programs such as Social Security. And contrary to what some of our opponents have said of me, there has never been a time when I have advocated pulling that rug out. As a matter of fact, the average married couple on Social Security today is getting $180 a month more than they were getting when I took office. But I think that looking at the demography, looking at the uh, statistics with regard to workers, earners, retirement, ages, and so forth, you have to look at programs of that kind as to whether they need restructuring for people just coming into the workforce and who one day will be uh, depending on those programs. Mr. President, in, in that general context, uh, the Democratic leaders in the House this afternoon reached tentative agreement on a, a plan for budget uh, deficit reduction. Uh, and it's, it's not too different from the one you uh, uh, supported uh, ahead of them, uh, give, uh, except for $50 billion difference. And I wondered whether there's, uh, you could see any give between those two plans that might uh, uh, bring a mutual agreement between uh, the Democrats on the House well, side. Well, this has always been my hope. Uh, we have to have, under the situation, with a majority of one party in one House and the majority of the other in the second House, uh, uh, we have to have bipartisan programs, but I haven't seen or heard what it is they've uh, come out with today or what they've come together on, and I'd like to see it and study it with regard to ours. Mr. President, uh, Minority Leader Byrd said the other day that Ed Meese will always have a cloud over him because of the, the allegations and charges that have come to light over the, the, the last few weeks in his nomination hearings. Why do you continue to back Mr. Meese and do you want to have an attorney general, should he be approved or, or, or sanctioned by the Senate, who when people see him may bring forth those thoughts that here's a guy who trades jobs for, for loans? Well, Gary, uh, that charge, let me just remind you of something about our administration and during the campaign something that I said. This idea of uh, job hunters uh, that could be purchased or something, let me point out, I said that we were going to try to get people in our administration who didn't want or need a government job. And we've done pretty much that. And uh, so the situation is a little distorted with regard to that. The, no, we have an investigation now that's going forward that, uh, Ed Meese uh, has supported the idea. He wants it. And uh, so I can't comment on particulars now because there is such an investigation, but I have complete confidence in him. I've known him for a great many years. And I think he'd make an excellent Attorney General. Well, you have confidence in him, Mr. President, but the perception, as Senator Mathias of Maryland said the other day, is, is one that could cause a problem not only with the Senate, but with the American people as well. Well, perception is something that's always present in government and in politics, and there are an awful lot of wrong perceptions about many things having to do with this administration. And uh, uh, I think when the truth is, uh, is known, when an investigation is completed, uh, then I think the American people are very fair and they can make their judgment. So you, so you don't think, let me just finish up, Jerry. So you don't think then that he should step aside or withdraw, or you wouldn't ask no. him to do that? No, because then there would be a cloud uh, over him, because he would no longer have the means, or there would no longer be investigations or anything by which uh, he could be cleared. Sir, has he Mr. offered to step aside? No, Mr. President, and I wouldn't listen if he did. Were you aware of these loans and transactions at the time you nominated him? What's that? Were you aware of these loans and transactions at the time you nominated him? No, I hadn't uh, delved into his personal life. I do know that 
like so many others that came into these government jobs, I knew that he had to make some pretty great economic sacrifices uh, to come here and work for the government. In a general sense, Mr. President, does it concern you that, uh, uh, there, that there may be an appearance of uh, possible impropriety in a situation where there are six instances where people, whatever the per reasons were, where people who provided financial help to, uh, to Mies did receive jobs in the administration? I'm not imputing any, any, any wrong motives to anybody, no. but there is that factual situation. I know, but as I answered a moment ago, I think someone should take a look and see uh, what did they have to give up in order to take that government job. And uh, most of the people in our administration uh, had to give up a great deal. But Mr. President, it's more than just a paycheck with the government. It's, it's a whole question of, of influence and being able to uh, get on the inside with, in, in government agencies and so forth. It's more than just a, giving up a high paying job in private industry. For, for another job in government. It's a, uh, the perception, again, without impugning any motives to some people, is buying influence in the government. I don't know. I, I just have to tell you that there are more people who actually are public-spirited enough, believed enough in what we were trying to do, that they wanted to be of help in that, than anyone is giving a, giving them credit for. You know, Mr. President, a related problem that occurs in situations like this is that, is that the situation itself may, in the end, be damaging to the, administ the administration or the president, whoever he may be. A situation of that type occurred in President Carter's administration with his good friend, Bert Lance. And Lance eventually, uh, eventually withdrew from his position as head of the Budget Bureau but it had, it had damaged the administration. It, it, are you, are you, is there con any concern on your part that there is that prospect of, of No, if damage? I thought that there was anyone who, in our administration, who was doing something that was contrary to the public interest and the interests of the people, I'd be the first one to take action to, to oust them. On the other hand, I've never been one that wanted to throw the baby out of the sleigh to the wolves uh, in order to lighten the load. Mr. President, on another subject, if I might. Secretary Schultz said today that uh, uh, we must accept the results of the Salvadoran election, whatever those might be. But realistically, do you think that if um, uh, that Congress would sanction continued aid to a regime headed by uh, this fellow Dobison, who's suspected of involvement in murder? And secondly, do you have any message for those um, Salvadoran military leaders who are rumored to be thinking about a coup? Well. Certainly, I would not support the idea of a coup. We have a democratic government there, probably for the first time in 400 years, that um, has been doing its best to institute a democracy and democratic principles, practices. And uh, I'm not going to say a word now about anyone who is a candidate there, because I think that the United States I want to be of help, and uh, I think we should be of help down there, but I don't think we should say anything that indicates that we are taking sides in this, in this election. I don't think that's our, our place. Mr. President, in, in uh, much of the rural America, farmers have been beset by large uh, crop surpluses, depressed prices, increased competition, from abroad. They've seen their neighbors facing bankruptcy. They've had trouble getting their own operating capital. I wonder, with that set of circumstances, why rural America should support you for another term? Now, I miss something. You know something? There's a terrible thing about this room here, and even in spite of my hearing problems, with that dome. When you get out there toward the center, at the beginning, you, but, uh, you're- Much of rural America, Today oh, farmers. Yeah. Ah, well, there's no question but that in the cost price squeeze, the inflationary spiral and the high interest rates that reached their peaks in 1980, the farmers were probably hurt worse than any other segment of our society. The, their cost skyrocketed at the same time that in all of the inflation, their 
the prices they could obtain were going down, and then they had the embargo thrown at them, which uh, uh, was a serious blow to a large segment of our farm economy. On the other hand, the uh, bankruptcies that uh, some people are talking about today, last year there were 270,000 loans out to farmers, and less than one half of one percent uh, resulted in, in bankruptcies. Now, I, so I don't think that this is, that that is a, a major problem there. What we've been able to do is, by bringing down inflation, uh, reduce the ever-increasing cost of operation for them. By our PIC program, we, by eliminating a great deal of the surplus, we have increased prices for their products. The other that surplus hung over them and was an artificial uh, cap on them. We are going to be, the Department of Agriculture is going to be lending some $4.6 billion uh, this year in help to the farmers. We have now eliminated the embargo, opened up foreign trade for them. The new long-term agreement with the Soviet calls for 50% more uh, than had been in the agreement. So the farmer will be the slowest in coming back, but is coming back, and there is improvement um, in, out there in the, in the agribusiness. You're asking them to, to stay the course with you? Yes. Uh, things will get better? Yes, they, they are getting better, and they are better. Mr. President, why do you insist that, uh, that the sale of the Stinger planes go through to Jordan in, in light of what uh, King Hussein said this past weekend and in light of what Secretary of State Schultz has, uh, has said in the last couple of days. Are you still hanging in there for that sale or, or, or are you willing to pull it back? Well, let me just say I'm not going to talk about details of it other than to say that the whole basis for peace in the Middle East and the thing that we tried to help bring about and are going to continue to try and help bring about is dependent on being fair and even-handed in dealing with the moderate Arab states that I think also want peace. Israel, and we know our relationship with Israel and what it has always been and will continue to be, and it, we can't appear to be one-sided. Jordan uh, and King Hussein had the courage to uh, participate and make himself available for uh, the peace efforts, and he is in a position in which there was some risk entailed with the border that he has with Syria, and uh, therefore I think that it is only fair. And if we don't, if we don't make available the things that he needs for his own security, he's going to find them someplace else. Could I, with the, oh, could I follow up on that, Mr. President? Yeah, the, me too. One of the most damaging things, uh, charges, though, it seems to me that uh, King Hussein made was to, in effect, say that your administration and some previous ones as well have not been honest brokers in the Middle East. How do you respond to that? Well, I read what he said in the interview, but then I also saw him on television last uh, Sunday, and uh, I thought that there was a, a, there was a, a a sort of withdrawal from some of what had been cited as more extreme uh, statements. But I do know this, we've had a friendship, and uh, uh, I think he, he and his country are essential to the to peace in the Middle East, and we're not going to give up that goal uh, very lightly. Mr. President, last week, uh, EPA Administrator Ruckelsall said that while in principle the administration supports reauthorizing Superfund, nothing would be done until after the election. I'm wondering why the delay, and can people in towns that are contaminated with, with various chemicals like dioxin, such as Times Beach, be assured that there will be government help? Well, I don't know of anyone here that thinks that the Superfund is going to await the taking place of an election. Uh, Bill Ruckel's house has, has made it plain to me that he's determined to carry on with that program. So there will be, is there, is there a plan or, or a deadline when the administration plans to come out and say what, at what level you will reauthorize Superfund? 
Well, you've got me a, a little short on this one. I've, uh, uh, things have been going along over there and very well, and I know that he's been uh, uh, establishing himself and getting these programs uh, into operation, and so uh, I just don't know the basis for the question there, whether there's some... Mr. President, I'm not familiar with the data. I think we'll have to check into it. Yeah. Because I don't, I'm not in the yeah. house today. Mr. President, have you given any uh, thought to your campaign yet? And whether you'll campaign differently against Mr. Mondale or Mr. Hart, uh, should one or the other be the nominee? No, I don't think it'll make much difference uh, who the other fellow is. I, I've always preferred campaigning on the basis of what we've done and what we intend to do. We're looking to the future with who, positive new ideas. Who would you sooner face? Huh? Who would you sooner face? Uh, I won't answer you that. I'm not going to help them out. <laughs> They're going to have to make that choice themselves. Well, looking to the future with positive new ideas sounds like Gary Hart. Uh, it did? Do I you, don't know. <laughs> do, you, uh, do, do you envision a run against him uh, more than Mondale at this point? No, I was just talking that my idea of a campaign is to uh, give the balance sheet on what we've done, what we've accomplished, and what we intend to do if given the opportunity to go forward on this. And I think we've got a lot of things to be proud of, things that are drastically different. Uh, very few of you have realized that for the last three years, unlike the last 50, there haven't been arguments going on in Washington about whether or not and what to spend additional money on. The arguments have been on where do we cut. Mr. President, you've called, um, to follow up with another political question, if I may, you've called Mondale Vice President Malays in the past, I believe, and uh, uh, if it's fair, I, I wonder if it is fair to blame him for the, for the mistakes of the Carter administration, and if so, are there any mistakes in your administration that you'd attribute to George Bush? Uh, <laughs> no, and uh, believe me, uh, George has been a working partner in this administration. I think probably more so than most other vice presidents that I can recall. Uh, I don't recall actually tying his name to that. I have talked about that, all that talk of malaise back at a time when they were trying to explain the, uh, our economic problems as being blamed on the people. He was the suspected target, I guess. Oh, no. well, no, I, uh, I haven't been targeting anyone. I've been talking about, we came here with a whole policy of government that we inherited that had been on one path of growth in government, constant increasing of the amount of earnings that we took away from the people for government, government doing more and more things, uh, and many of them that were not government's proper province, and we set out uh, to streamline this somewhat. We set out to give the economy a chance and give the people a chance out there, and I think it's worked. Uh, we have the greatest decline in unemployment in more than 30 years. Uh, I believe we have an, an, an economic improvement that is it's on a solid basis and not just a temporary quick fix, an artificial stimulant, which has been characteristic of seven previous recessions since World War II. Uh, I'm proud of what we've done with regard to the uh, military. We have the highest percentage of high school graduates in our military today than we have ever had in the history of this country. And that is, includes back when we had the draft, which was an all-encompassing sweep that took in everybody. We have 91% of our personnel out there are high school graduates. And uh, there's a morale, there's a readiness, the, uh, that I think is uh, something the people of this country uh, have every reason and right to be proud of. Mr. President, I've often wondered, uh, the, we see the charge made very often, uh, and usually by opponents of yours, that, uh, that your administration is the administration of the wealthy, that uh, uh, you don't have much sensitivity for poor folks, for minorities, and so forth. I'm sure you're familiar with all these mm -hmm. charges. They've been made over and over again. I was just curious as to how does that make you feel? I mean, what do you feel about that? Does that disturb you? Does that bother you? Does that... Uh, it frustrates uh, me, yes. And it is a part of what Gary was talking about a little while ago. It's a perception. 
and it's a perception that is based absolutely on falsehoods. We can turn to any area of the society we want to, and we will find out that none of those things are, are true. Was reducing 12.5% inflation and bringing it down to around 3%, was that more beneficial to the rich than it was to the lower income person who had to spend the bulk of their income and didn't have any to put aside? Uh, a fellow in 1979 that was making $5,000 a year, which would leave him pretty poor, by the end of 1980, in just those two years, his 5000 would only buy what $4,000 uh, would have bought before, simply because of inflation. We tripled the taxes in a decade or so before we got here. The personal earnings, well, let me give a figure, not just personal earnings. In the last several years before we got here, there were three increases in the grants to people on the program Aid for Dependent Children. And at the end of the three increases, they were poorer and had less purchasing power than they had before the increases went into effect because of inflation. And of course, the increase in taxes, uh, as I say, they, well, they doubled in the last uh, four or five years before we came here. But, but the priority was cutting government spending, was cutting programs. Uh, uh, the administration wasn't saying we want to go out and help all these people. And, I mean, it no, was a, but, but we the did. emphasis. Maybe, maybe right. the perception is because of the emphasis. Well, wait a minute. Here's, here's what we did. Many of those programs had become so encrusted, the administration so big, that the federal government was paying a tremendous fee for every dollar that it delivered to a needy person. The things we were trying to cut was not the dollar to the needy person. It was the sometimes two dollars it took to deliver that to him. On the other hand, we also found people in these programs that had no justification for being there. Uh, when people were earning above 150 percent of the poverty level, as much as up to 180 percent, and still being declared eligible for these programs, we felt something had to be done, and we redirected those pro programs toward those who were truly needy. And today, we are feeding more people. We are taking care of more people. We are funding more students going to college than ever before in our history. We are giving more food stamps to more people than we were ever giving in our history. And yet, we got 800 and some thousand people off of food stamps but we increased the number, total number that we're getting food stamps, but the 800,000 or more, it was around 860,000, those people were of an income that was above a level in which their neighbors should have been contributing to their welfare. I don't wanna, but I, no. you, you say it frustrates you, and, and there has to be a way to, ch to counter this, to change it. How, how would you go about uh, changing this perception? Well, I'm hopeful as the campaign goes on, we'll tell the truth. And uh, you see, so far, it's just been a constant drumbeat on the other side, the fairness issue. Well, and uh, that somehow our tax program benefited the rich, uh, not uh, those at the lower level of income. And yet the very people saying this have been fighting and fighting to get us to cancel indexing. Well, if you canceled indexing, the penalty for canceling it would run about 2% increase in taxes for the person at $100,000. It would be a 9% increase for the person at $10,000. Now, does that make us the administration of the wealthy or the rich? The truth of the matter is, in everything from college loans to grant programs to food stamps, we took programs that were, were benefiting people who were really should not be dependent on government, and we redirected that money to the, to the people of true need. And actually, with all of these supposed cuts in budgets, no, all we've done, all we've been able to do is reduce the rate of increase in spending. We're spending more. We're just not spending as much more. And if we had stuck to the budgets of our predecessor, his, you know how you have to project now under the law several years ahead. If we had stuck to his projected budgets 
today's deficit would be $191 billion more than it is. But there are three or four more million, three or four million more people below the poverty level now, according to the Census Bureau's figures, than there were when you took office. How does, how does that? Not than when we took office. The recent survey that was widely touted was from 1979 to 1982. Right. Well, 1982, we just started, because when you take office in 1981, you take office inheriting the budget already in place and the programs already in place from your predecessor. Now, our program for economic recovery had just begun in 1982 to be phased in. But we had that great further dip in the 1970 and 80 recession in July of 1981. Not one bit of our program was in place when that big fall into 10.8% unemployment and so forth, when that took place. So of course there are more people in poverty in, in that particular year. But the decline, or the increase, I should say, in the number of people in living in poverty, where is the, what is the number of people living in poverty in 1983? And once the recovery was underway. The truth is, if they wanted to even go back farther, back in the 60s, the early 60s, we had fewer people living below the poverty line than we had in the later 60s after the Great War on Poverty got underway. And there has been, from that moment on, a steady increase in the level of poverty right on up uh, to the, the pr figures that were used, the 1979, 82 figures. Mr. Could I ask? Oh, thanks. Could I ask a question on the deficit? You've proposed a down payment on the deficit, but that still would leave you with pretty large budget yeah. deficits. And I wonder if the choices on a second down payment aren't going to become more difficult. Business Week magazine has proposed, and I wonder if you could react to their suggestions on how to reduce yeah. the deficit. I found them interesting that uh, some cuts in Social Security and Medicare, which would be sensitive, slowing the defense buildup, which you'd rather not do, slashing farm supports, which could be uh, politically dangerous, cutting state and city aid some more, cutting federal pensions and raising taxes on the middle class. So, <laughs> do you reject all of those? or uh, Quite a few of them. <laughs> yes, I do quite a few. Now, we have part of our own proposal is a freeze on farm payments, as you know. But that was because the 1981 Farm Bill when it was passed was based on what they had projected would be a much higher inflation rate. And so we're spending in the farm program several times more than we should have been spending. Um, no, what I said, this is a down payment because the structural changes, the things such as the Grace Commission, their recommendations, these are going to take really bipartisan approach and study because these are, your deficit was made up of half recession and half structural. That structural thing was built in. That was the automatic increases that just took place as every year went by and the Congress didn't have to increase them. They, they were there. Now, we need structural reform. The, the, the recovery is already, has already had some reductions of over our own estimates of the deficit. As you know, last summer we were estimating above $200 billion and suddenly it is down sizably more than that, down around uh, 180. That is the recovery that's doing that. Now that will continue as the recovery continues. Or I've got to stop saying recovery. Some of the leading in economists in the country have contacted me and said I should no longer use that word because we're beyond recovery. We are now into expansion. So the expansion will continue. But the structural part will remain a threat until we deal with it. And this is where, as I say, I think that we, not only in those commission reports, but everything else, we must look at structural reforms that can be made that will leave government doing what government is intended to do. For example, some of the savings that we made were by way of things we call block grants. As governor, I came here knowing that in California, the categorical grants where the federal government gave the state of California X amount of money for a certain program and then told us right down to the smallest T how and we could use that money and what must be done with it. Well, it didn't meet our priorities 
maybe it met the next state's priorities, but ours were different, and then someone else's were different. And so I came here conceiving this idea of let's put the money for general purpose in block grants and turn them over to the states and localities and give them the ability to administer these as they know they will be most efficient. And this allowed, the, there again, the money that was being saved in reducing these amounts was the administrative overhead that was being eliminated. And we must do more of this. You know, when a mayor uh, tells you that a program with regard to transportation for the handicapped, the way the government, the federal government forced it on him, so costly that he, he could have sent taxi cabs for every handicapped person that needed a transportation and been money ahead if he'd have been allowed to do that. It wouldn't have cost as much as the, it did doing it the way the federal government said they had to do it. So these are the type of structural reforms that they're just waiting to be implemented. And, uh, In the second administration? Second, uh, the second Reagan administration? Yes. You going to get a prayer amendment in the second administration? I'm going to try. Uh, and here again. That. Could you just tell what? us uh, uh, the prayer amendment in the Senate? The well, we got a majority, but a majority were for it, but we didn't get the two-thirds. But here again, could I take advantage of you? I know Larry says we're through. Let, let me take advantage of you, though, for one thing. And, and uh, maybe the media in some ways has helped with this, certainly in the editorial pages. I've talked to senators, and who voted against this? Uh, and so caused its not getting the two-thirds. And was amazed to find that their reason for voting against it was they felt that they were voting against where government was going to mandate school prayer on the schools. And there was nothing of the kind. That isn't what we had before the Supreme Court decision. When, when I was going to six elementary, different elementary schools in eight years because my father moved around so much and, uh, and it was taken for granted that there was no ban on prayer in schools. But we didn't have concerted prayer. Oh, I, I can remember a few times when some classmate was ill or some student's mother was very ill, and the teacher might say, let's all pray uh, for the recovery, and so forth. Things of that kind. All the amendment we proposed would do would be to say, if the schools want to, that's up to them. It's permitted. The Constitution does not deny it, them the right. What we did specify was that no, they couldn't write a prayer, and no, they couldn't dictate a specific prayer or dictate a method of doing this. They didn't have to do it at all if they didn't want to. And many of the schools, I say, that I attended didn't, other than on occasions of this kind. And for senators who were up there in the debate to be so convinced that what they were voting against was, was an order, a mandate on the schools. We just wanted to give the authority back to the schools to do what they wanted to do. They missed the boat. So we'll try to make it more, huh? They missed the boat. What? They missed the boat. They, they just didn't un understand it. And uh, we, uh, we got the majority vote this afternoon, but it wasn't a two-thirds. So a constitutional amendment requires the two-thirds. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. We right. didn't have those problems in my school with prayed all the time. I was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know.